The way we lead impacts the way people live. This world needs truly human leadership. How do the things we admire in our leaders become part of their character? What drives them to lead in the way that they do? And if they're the type of people we want to be more like, if we want to emulate their leadership, how can we set ourselves up to do the same? For me, the answer I found is we have to consciously practice the behaviors that embody the traits we admire in them. I'm Brent Stewart, your host. Thanks for listening. This podcast is an outreach of Barry Wayman. You can connect with us on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, and Twitter at Barry Waymiller and find our podcasts, articles, and videos at trulyhumanleadership.com. You may recognize the name David Mead from the time he spent as one of Simon Sinek's igniters, where he helped share Simon's simple, inspiring ideas through speaking and workshops to over 225 companies on five continents. David also co-authored with Simon and Peter Docker The companion piece to Simon's Start With Why book, Find Your Why, a practical guide for discovering the why of an individual, team, or organization. Now, David stepped away from Simon's team in 2019 to focus his energy on long-term consulting in leadership and culture. And recently, he took part in a webinar hosted by Chapman & Co. Leadership Institute, Barry Waymiller's Leadership and Culture Consulting Arm. David's webinar was titled Behind the Curtain, how to drop the act and lead with character. And on this episode of our podcast, we bring you an edited version of his talk. David asks a lot of questions in this webinar that should make us look inward and look at how we are leading the people within our span of care. And you can find out more about David at his website, davidjmead.com. And you can find out more about Chapman Co. Leadership Institute, their services, webinars, and they've got a lot of great content as well. You can find them at ccoleadership.com. Now, here's David Mead. I'd like you to think about some times in your life where these three things may have happened to you, where a colleague or a boss has thrown you under the bus, where you have gotten in trouble for making a values-based decision at work, or when someone you rely on doesn't fulfill a promise that they've made. Generally, when these things happen, they're unexpected. Right? They, they sort of throw us for a loop. We, these things happen to us and we think, oh my gosh, what just happened? I, I wasn't expecting that. Now, you're probably, most of you, if not all of you, are probably familiar with a group of friends that also experienced a lot of unexpected things. Um, these are characters in a movie called The Wizard of Oz. Now, the story starts out with a girl named Dorothy, and she ends up in this place called Oz after a tornado picks up her Kansas farmhouse with her, uh, her and her little dog Toto still inside. So as soon as Dorothy gets to Oz, all she wants to do is get back home to Kansas, but she has no idea how to get there. And the first person that she meets in Oz is Glinda, the Good Witch of the North. And Glinda tells Dorothy about this great and wonderful wizard who will be able to help her fulfill her wish of getting home. So expecting to get the help she's looking for, Dorothy and her little dog Toto start down the yellow brick road that leads toward the Emerald City where the wizard lives. Now, along her journey, Dorothy meets uh, three friends. She meets a scarecrow whose only wish is to have a brain. She meets a tin man who would do anything for a heart and a cowardly lion who longs for courage. Now, confident the wizard will be able to help them all, they team up and they make their way to the Emerald City together. And all the way, they're singing the praises of this wonderful Wizard of Oz. Now, they finally arrive at the doors of the Emerald City and they're shown down this long hallway that leads to the wizard. But when they reach the large room at the end of the hallway, they experience the wizard in a completely different way than they were expecting. He has this booming voice and he appears as this huge green holographic head and he's got billowing smoke and giant flames all around him and they're terrified. This is not the wizard that they've been told about. Then the wonderful wizard proceeds to rake them over the coals. He berates them individually for their frailties and their audacity to even come to him for help. And after this angry rant, Dorothy and her friends experience something unexpected again. The wizard agrees to help them, but only after they've proven themselves worthy. And he demands that they go and they bring him the broomstick of the very dangerous Wicked Witch of the West. Recognizing they might be killed, but feeling like they have really no other choice, the foursome along with little Toto leave empty handed on this seemingly impossible quest. Now against all odds, they actually succeed and they return to the Emerald City with the broomstick in hand. 
But the wizard, who can't believe they're still alive, rudely asks why they've come back. Despite her fear, Dorothy presents the broomstick, but again, the wizard unexpectedly refuses to help them and tells them they got to come back the next day. Now, Dorothy's getting pretty frustrated, and so she argues back and forth with the wizard, trying to get him to fulfill on his promises. Now, during that back and forth, little Toto saunters over to a green curtain that's off to the side, and he grabs one end in his mouth, and he pulls the curtain back. And Dorothy and her friends look over to see this elderly man working really hard, turning dials and pulling levers and flipping switches and shouting into a microphone. Noticing that he's been exposed, the man frantically pulls the curtain closed again and shouts into the microphone, pay no attention to that man behind the curtain. But it's too late. The wizard's true identity has been revealed, the face, the smoke, the flames, all of it was just an elaborate illusion meant entirely to deceive people and hide who he truly was. So what's the point of me telling you a children's story of four friends and their interactions with this fictional wizard? It's because I have personally felt the damaging effects of what I call the Oz moments, when I've experienced people differently than I expected because they were hiding behind the curtain. And at times, I've also been the one behind the curtain pretending to be someone I wasn't. Being behind the curtain is just shorthand for putting up a facade, being fake, and pretending to be something or someone we're not. Now, sometimes we do this in order to protect ourselves in a toxic environment. Sometimes we do it to advance our own interest at the expense of others. But no matter the reason we do it, the curtain creates division. It hinders human connection. It can damage relationships and erode trust. And when those on a team are hiding behind the curtain, long-term sustainable progress is hindered. Now, we all hide behind the curtain at times, and often we just don't realize it. For example, I've pretended that everything was fine at work when it really wasn't because I was afraid of how my boss would react if I brought up an issue. I've tried to say the right things to the right people to try to protect my job or feel more secure in my job. And early in my speaking career, I even pretended to know more than I did to hide my inexperience. Hiding behind the curtain takes a lot of mental energy. When we're lying, faking, and hiding, we have to keep our stories straight. We find ourselves having to tell more lies to cover up for the original ones, and it gets confusing, let alone really exhausting. But hiding behind the curtain is what causes these unexpected experiences, like the unexpected experiences that Dorothy and her friends had with the wizard. Because when we're hiding something, there's always the possibility it might be revealed. So our job as leaders, whether we have an official position of leadership or not, is to do whatever we can to eliminate the unexpected, to stay in front of the curtain, and to create environments where others can do the same. In 1955, a couple of psychologists by the name of Joseph Luft and Harrington Ingham developed a model called the Johari Window. And it was designed to help people better understand their relationship with themselves and others. So what's known to us, or what's known to self is on one axis. And then what's known to others about us uh, is on the other. Now the goal is to be in the top left quadrant. It's what they call the arena. Uh, in my terms, this would be in front of the curtain. It's where what we know and what others know is out in the open. It's where open communication and transparency live, right? The bottom left quadrant is called the facade. It represents what is known to us, but not to others. It's, it's when we intentionally conceal information from others. So in my terms, this would be behind the curtain, right? Now the top right quadrant represents our blind spots. It's what's not known to us, but is known to others. In other words, they can see the things that we can't. And then the bottom right quadrant is the things that neither we or others yet know. Uh, and these could represent things that we just simply haven't discovered like talents or interests or convictions. Now, what I really like about this model is that the quadrants aren't meant to stay the same size. The goal is actually to increase the size of the arena so the other three quadrants get smaller. Now, my focus today will be on how we uh, reduce the size of the facade portion of the window and expand the arena or stay in front of the curtain. Um, and, and the question is, how do we do that? We have to practice the traits that give us the ability to share more about ourselves and to feel like we 
can share those things with others. I've had the, the great opportunity to work with people from all over the world over the last decade or so. And when it comes to leadership, I've noticed a, a clear pattern in the type of leaders that people respond to best. Nearly everybody prefers a leader who brings an, an element of humanity to their leadership, right? Leaders who are empathetic, who extend trust, who have compassion, who are great listeners, who give encouragement. These are what I call human leaders. Now, my own experience matches that same pattern. I first experienced human leadership in a job when I was 17, working at a bagel shop. And believe it or not, I've compared every other job I've had to that one because my boss, we'll call him Brad, had such an incredible impact on me. He embodied the traits of a human leader. He didn't go to school to learn how to do it. It was just part of who he was. But it begs the question, how do the things we admire in our leaders become part of their character? What drives them to lead in the way that they do? And if they're the type of people we want to be more like, if we want to emulate their leadership, how can we set ourselves up to do the same? Well, for me, the answer I found is we have to consciously practice the behaviors that embody the traits we admire in them. Now, we can make a list of dozens of qualities and attributes that define a human leader. And you've just given a, a, you know, dozens of examples uh, and, and those are all uh, valid and they look very much like the list that I've made myself. And as I've considered that list of attributes or qualities of a human leader, I've found that most, if not all of the things on that list fall under three overarching traits. Now I'll share my definition of each one of these. Uh, it's not the right definition, it's just the way I think about it. Uh, and then we'll dive into each one in a little bit more detail. So honest, humble, and human. Let's start with honest. An honest leader behaves in alignment with what they stand for. And they acknowledge when they step off course. They have the presence of mind to recognize when they're not being, when they're not being honest, when they're not doing what they say. A humble leader drops their ego, admits fallibility, and learns from mistakes. And a human leader illuminates the value in those they influence. And importantly, they consider the impact of the decisions they make on those individuals. Now, these three traits to me define human leadership and we can't have one without the others. <clears throat> if you imagine honest, humble and human as a three-legged stool, that might help. A lot of organizations focus on these three areas in some way as they either uh, work to attract new employees or keep the talent that they already have. For example, they might claim to, to live their values, right? Uh, suggesting that they're, they're, they're honest. Um, they might talk about how they encourage collaboration where everyone's ideas are considered and nobody's better than anybody else. And, and you know, this, this humble idea, we can all learn together. Or they'll talk about uh, how important it is for them to put their people first, right? Really focusing in on this human element. And all of that sounds great. And the three legs of the stool seem solid. And so ask yourself, if you were presented with an opportunity to work in an organization that said all of these things with those three legs of the stool seeming to be very solid, would you sit on it? Probably, I would. But what if I gave you a closer look at how the stool was actually built? What if I turned it over and showed you that it was barely held together with masking tape and gum? How likely would you be to sit on it then? That feeling of sitting on a stool we know won't hold us is what it feels like when human leadership is missing. Even if just one of the legs isn't attached properly, the entire stool falls over when we add the pressures that come every day, like deadlines and client demands and budgets. When those stresses enter the equation, the focus easily shifts away from honest, humble, and human. And all of a sudden, what we so often call the soft stuff doesn't seem as relevant. Now, it's still nice to talk about, and we try to convince people it's still important, but it's just a facade. We don't really care about it, and the worst part is people can feel it. Now, a lot of us have experienced something like this, where the stool has broken, where one of the legs was weak, uh, and the stool fell over. I have a friend who had the courage to talk to his boss about how morale on the team was low because the company culture was suffering. And even though, supposedly, the boss really seemed to care about the culture, my friend had a very unexpected experience. Instead of being listened to and having his feelings acknowledged, the boss told my friend there was no culture issue and he was the problem. 
That's just one example of how the stool breaks and it can break in all kinds of ways, but however it happens, we aren't too eager to sit on that stool again. We want to see it rebuilt with strong glue and screws. We want our leaders to prove the strength of the stool before we'll be willing to trust it again. So when the stool breaks, no matter what the tangible consequence is, it's the feeling or the intangibles that we often remember most. For example, with Dorothy and her friends, it wasn't only what happened to them, it was what they felt as a result. They felt disempowered and belittled and unsafe and judged and brushed aside and felt betrayed, right? Felt uh, unsafe, untrusted, all of these horrible feelings that come along with that. And human leadership really focuses on those intangibles, on what we feel at work, so that we can intentionally build and reinforce that stool so it will support those who sit on it. Now, all of us obviously have uh, some responsibility to contribute to the strength of our culture's collective three-legged stool, but leaders, those in a role of leadership have a special uh, responsibility to ensure its sturdiness. Being a human leader means our people know that we're consistently working to secure those three legs of the stool so that it will support them when weight is put on it. Now, importantly, honest, humble, and human are outcomes. They're the result of making consistent choices in service of others over time. The trend is what matters. And like any other favorable quality we may be trying to develop as leaders or as individuals, honest, humble, and human are not labels that we can ascribe to ourselves. We can't call ourselves a human leader. We can't call ourselves a humble leader. It's only true when other people choose to describe us that way. It's sort of like telling someone you're a great listener, but unless that person really feels they're being listened to, your personal assessment of your listening, listening skills is irrelevant. So human leadership really is a filter for our behavior. And it's not reserved for those in positions of authority. It's for anyone who wants to support those around them. It's for anyone who has any type of influence over the lives of others. So it's really for all of us. Human leadership is a daily pursuit. And when we can follow that pursuit of becoming honest, humble, and human, it allows us to act consistently with character in front of the curtain, rather than acting as a character behind the curtain. So let's talk a little bit about each one of these three traits of human leadership. And we'll start with uh, honest. For me, the way I think about it is an honest leader be behaves in alignment with what they stand for, right? And they acknowledge when they step off course. So as I consider the people I respect most, they have made the trait of honest part of their character. They're consistent, they do what they say. They have a, what I call a personal code and they behave in alignment with it. Now our code is a, is a baseline of norms and guidelines we set for ourselves. And those guidelines help us determine what appropriate thoughts and actions look like as we interact with others. A code provides direction essentially, and importantly, it keeps us headed in the right direction. Now, keep in mind, our code isn't good or bad. It's not something to be judged, it just is. However, if our intent is to become a human leader, someone who lifts others up, and our code dictates that we watch out primarily for ourselves, we need to perhaps just reevaluate re our code. Now, my friend Peter is a great example of this trait of honest. As long as I have known him, he's always talked about the desire that he has to lift other people up and to support them as they uh, switch jobs or struggle through personal or career challenges. But he doesn't just talk about it. He's done it for me and for dozens of others over the time that I've known him. And I know that when he says it, he means it and he does it. He's consistent. Now, truth, being honest, leads to trust. So if trust comes from being an honest leader, it's important to be conscious of the ways the honest leg of the stool can break. And in my experience, I've seen three things that can be particularly damaging. First is an inconsistency in words and actions where consistency is important. Doing what we say is important. This happens when uh, this inconsistency comes up when what we say, what we preach, or what we promise is not what we actually do. The trust and confidence that we have in somebody can be built or destroyed based on the harmony or the dissonance between their words and actions. It's sort of like, um, you know, a lot of us, and, and drop this in the chat if this has ever happened to you, <clears throat> but if you've ever had a flaky contractor, right, who promised that your job would be done in two weeks, but actually it takes over two months and they almost never answer your phone calls. 
no matter how great the job looks when it's done, trust is non-existent. At work, this happens all the time too. And it might look like um, us telling our team we have an open door policy, but brushing them off every time one of them asks if we have a minute to talk. It's just inconsistent. Second is inconsistency in accountability. And this happens when we try to avoid potentially negative consequences by transferring the ownership of an issue to something or someone else. Leadership and influence come with accountability. It's just part of the package. And if we want to lead, we have to be willing to put skin in the game. We have to be willing to step up and to own our part. Um, the way I think about it is sort of like, you know, if we were to put all the blame on the driver that we rear-ended in traffic because we were busy looking at our phones and didn't realize that they stopped abruptly in front of us, it just doesn't work. We're responsible for our part. Now at work, this might look like someone on our team approaching us about a, a, a tense situation or a relationship issue that they're having and wanting us to help resolve an issue. But because we don't want to strain a relationship with either them or the other person, we send them to HR instead. All right, the third way that the leg, the honest leg of the stool can often break is an inconsistency in focus. This happens when our priorities, our mindset, or our vision shift sporadically based on the current environment. It's sort of like uh, a parent who reads an article about how important sleep is for growing kids. Realizing their kids aren't getting enough sleep, they implement a new earlier bedtime. It's like, no excuses, we're all in, this is what we're doing, right? But the kids, they struggle to adjust to this new schedule. Then a few weeks later, cousins come into town for spring break, bedtime goes out the window, never to return again, right? Now we're onto something else, forget about that last thing. Many of us have experienced this type of inconsistency at work too, I know I have. I remember starting projects so many times only to be told by my boss a couple of weeks later that, yeah, we're not doing that anymore. I mean, if it happens once or twice, it's one thing, but when it becomes the norm, people get cynical. It's like uh, some of you may have heard the story of the boy who cried wolf, right? When we do it too many times when it's not actually true, people won't even respond. Okay, let's take a look at a humble leader. What do they do? is a humble leader drops their ego, admits fallibility, and learns from mistakes. Now, sadly, it's so much more common to see examples where humble is lacking, right? I mean, ego is the arch enemy of humility. We seem to see that more often than we see humility. And we all sometimes fall prey to ego because we're naturally concerned about ourselves. And to an extent, that's okay. It becomes a problem though, when acting in our own interests has a negative impact on others. So remember back to the story of the Wizard of Oz, how the wizard sent Dorothy and her friends on this life-threatening quest just to protect his own identity. Now, I have to believe that our overall intentions are probably good, but even then, sometimes ego can hijack our actions. Uh, often we feel like we have to, to look out for ourselves due to the, the pressures we feel or the environments in which we operate. And that's when ego and a focus on self-interest can take over if we're not careful. So a couple of years ago, I, I rented a boat with my family at a lake near my home. But when our time was up, I headed back to the boat ramp where I was supposed to pull the boat onto its trailer that had been backed into the water for me. And I'd never done that before, but they assured me it was a piece of cake. So as I was approaching the trailer, the boat started to sort of drift sideways and I realized I wasn't gonna hit the, the trailer straight. And so I put the boat in reverse to try again, except it wasn't reverse. In my car, reverse is this way, but in a boat, this way makes it go forward really fast. And so the boat like lurched over the side of the trailer with this awful crunching sound. And while that was obviously a great opportunity for me to admit my own fallibility and practice humility, I was really impressed with the way the manager of the rental shop handled the situation. Of course, he still held me accountable for my mistake, but he took that opportunity to actually admit that their process could be improved. Instead of approaching it with the mindset that I would have expected, which is, well, this is how we've always done it and you're the only idiot that can't park a boat right, he and his team actually changed the way the boats are returned to help avoid accidents like that in the future. And I was really, really impressed by that. Now, in my experience, humble leaders have four key attributes. First is the willingness to do the things they expect of others. And this means that we get in the trenches when it serves the team. 
regardless of our role, regardless of our title or the inconvenience that it will likely cause. For example, if you go back to, to Brad, my bagel shop boss, when the store got really busy, he would never hesitate to put on an apron and help us make sandwiches during a lunch rush. It's just who he was. It was just what he did. And all the great leaders I've had have been willing to do the things they asked of others. Now, it doesn't mean they always had to or always did, but when it really mattered, they stepped in and served the team. Second is the confidence to let others lead. And this means that we accept our limitations of time, focus, or ability, and allow others to step up. And as much as we may want to or think we can, we just, we simply can't do it all. This can be a pretty tough pill to swallow, especially for those in leadership positions. But as we extend trust and allow people to try and fail and try again, we build their confidence in themselves and in turn, our confidence in them grows as well. For example, uh, it can be really hard to let our kids mow the lawn or fold the laundry because we can just do it so much better than they can because we have the experience. And it's the same thing at work. It's hard to let someone else take the lead on a project because they'll likely go about it differently than we would. But if we're a humble leader, we know that we are in a supporting role and we're willing to let go of control in order to help others develop. Third is the courage to ask for and accept help. This means first off that we recognize we don't know it all and asking for and accepting help when it's offered can be very humbling. It can be really uncomfortable to admit that we don't know something or don't know how to do something, especially when we feel like it's something we should know. For example, I'll often be talking with clients and they'll use acronyms or terminology that I don't know. And it's always hard to do, but I've gotten a little more used to it. But I ask them to explain what that means. And embarrassingly, sometimes it is something I should know at this stage of my career and experience. And it's very humbling that I don't know what that means. But more often than not, it's just industry or, or company specific jargon that they use so much. They don't realize other people don't know what it means. Okay, fourth attribute of a, of a humble leader is the ability to admit mistakes and learn from them. This means we're willing to endure the short-term discomfort or consequences of being wrong. And the environments in which we work make all the difference as to whether or not we'll be willing to admit our mistakes. We'll still make them, but are we willing to admit them? All depends on the environments in which we operate. Um, I, I found it really interesting in 2018, I gave a talk to a group of leaders in the agricultural industry in uh, Winnipeg, Canada. And after my talk, one of the attendees came up, um, he had resonated with the message and he wanted to share some of his ideas on leadership. And he mentioned that he was one of the leaders of the, uh, one of the financial institutions that provided loans and other financial services to members of that agricultural community. And something he said really stuck with me. He told me that when he hires a new employee, he tells them to make as many mistakes as they can to make them as quickly as possible. Because to him, the goal is not for people to be perfect at their jobs. It's for people to learn to get better at their jobs. And the only way that could happen is if he led in a way that welcomed and encouraged the making and admitting of mistakes early and often. Um, okay, so now onto our final trait, which is human. My definition uh, of a human leader is that they illuminate the value in those they influence. And importantly, they consider the impact of the decisions they make on the individuals that they lead. Human leaders are genuinely interested in people. They pour all they can into those they lead. If you think about it, we work so incredibly hard to hire the right people, right? But it doesn't end there. It's like buying a really nice car and then not charging the batteries or putting gas in it. No matter how impressive the car is, no matter how qualified and capable a person is, they simply won't perform at their best and they might even disengage unless we provide them with the power that makes them go. Now it's been a little while, but uh, I think time doesn't really uh, affect this particular study that Gallup did. They found uh, three things that I thought were really interesting. When our bosses ignore us, 40% of us actively disengage from our work. When our bosses criticize us, 22% of us actively disengage from our work. That's like a 50% improvement if they're being rude to us, at least they acknowledge we exist, right? But listen to this one. When our boss points out only one of our strengths, only 1% of us actively disengage. Imagine if we made the, that made it a habit to tell people their value, to tell them what they're doing well, to be positive about the work that they're doing. 
disengagement would be basically irrelevant, right? So I've noticed four key attributes of those who lead in a human way. First, they connect on a personal level. This means we care for each person on our team as an individual. So uh, interesting experience I had that really hit home for me on this one is a few years ago, I was on a remote team and for my birthday one year, the team sent me a really strange gift in the mail. It was a stick. Um, the idea was that you plant the stick and it's a dormant tree and it grows into this beautiful flowering tree. But the, the note that came along with the, the stick was what was really meaningful. They talked about how this was a representation of their commitment to my growth, my development, and my stability in the company. And I thought, wow, like that is so much more meaningful than a $20 yeah, Starbucks gift card, right? So find ways to connect with people on a personal level. Second, a human leader takes genuine interest in an individual's growth and development. This means that as a leader, we use our position to lift others up rather than keeping them down. And for me, a great example of this idea is Billy Bean. He's the executive vice president for the Oakland A's uh, baseball team. And a couple of years ago, I had uh, the chance to interview him for a podcast that I was hosting. And one of the things he mentioned was the excitement that he gets from helping someone climb the ranks of his organization and then go on to lead another franchise, another, another team. Um, and I thought that was really, really impressive. He really, uh, well, that was one of the things that excited him most about his job. Third, a human leader shows people they are valued and valuable. This means we actively let our people know that they, their work and their ideas matter. And one of the best example of this to me is Barry Waymiller. And it's one of the reasons I love working with them. I love working with Chapman and Co because um, of the way and the attitude with which they approach their people. Now, most of you probably are already familiar with how they treat their people, but when it comes to, to, a, to, to business process, any of the successful process improvements that they implement on their shop floors always involves input from the people closest to the issue, the people running the machines. Um, and if, if any of you have read Bob Chapman's book, um, the title really says it all, everybody matters. And they absolutely believe that and that's how they treat their people. Fourth, a human leader cares for self in order to care for others. Now, this means that we take time to recharge because when we don't, it affects people in a couple of ways. First, we can't show up at our best. And second, we send the sort of unspoken message that nobody needs a break. And if we don't do this, our people are less likely to do it themselves. I had a boss um, several years ago who every year without fail took a, a, a trip to Hawaii with her sister. She'd be gone for about 10 days and she would not do a stitch of work during that whole time. And I remember her coming back rested and energized and annoyingly tan and that energy transferred to the team. And it also gave us real permission to unplug when we took time off. Okay, folks, so I've given you sort of the, the broad overview of human leadership and just to tie a bow on it. I know this sounds really simple. Right? Behave in a way that's honest, humble, and human, and you'll be able to stay in front of the curtain. Right? You'll be able to avoid creating unexpected experiences that break down trust and ruin relationships. While the idea is simple, I know this can be really hard. This is the reason we don't do it, even though we know exactly what we should be doing. It's easy to think about this stuff and to come up with all the right answers in the vacuum of a webinar or a workshop, but when we add the pressures we face every single day, we're going to slip up. We get sucked into watching out for ourselves. And even though we might not do it with malicious intent, the facade goes up. And while the facade is up, people don't even know that what they're experiencing from us isn't real. That's the worst part. Our relationships will run on pretense and half-truths until we're exposed like the wizard. And that sucks. We have to think and realize that every interaction we have with others has the capacity to build or erode trust. We have dozens of opportunities throughout the day to practice. And when we don't get it right, we can choose to stay in front of the curtain. We can harness the practices of honest, humble, and human and openly talk about the unexpected experience that we've created instead of hiding behind the curtain. And when we do, we connect with people in a more human way and open the door for trust and long-term progress. When the curtain is lifted on your leadership, what do others find? Are you humble? Are you honest? 
Do you illuminate the value in those you influence and consider the impact of the decisions you make on those people? Don't forget to find us and connect on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, and Twitter at Barry Waymiller. And you can find more podcasts, articles, and videos at trulyhumanleadership.com. I'm Brent Stewart. Thanks for listening.